Salam everyone and welcome to SomaliDispatch.com. Justice for Abdurrahman is an advocacy group in Ottawa and it was created to secure justice for the late Abdurrahman Abdi, who died soon after Ottawa police officers were seen using force uh, in arresting him. For those of you who didn't get to see that video, that viral video, uh, here it is. Soon after that video was shared and went viral, uh, and Abdurrahman Abdi succumbed to his injury at the arrest time, uh, a justice advocacy groups in Ottawa got together and formed Justice for Abdurrahman. Naima Ali is a former spokesperson for the family of uh, late Abdurrahman Abdi, and she joined us from Ottawa to talk to us about that issue and all the efforts that the group is putting in to secure justice for Abdurrahman Abdi. Welcome to Somali Dispatch, Nim Ali. Uh, thanks for taking uh, the time to um, do this with us and uh, for our viewers. Um, let's just uh, start by asking you, Ottawa, um, the nation's capital is no different than other mer uh, major urban centers in terms of police activity in the communities. Uh, what is that like in Ottawa? Uh, if you can give an overview picture to our listeners and watchers. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it for this opportunity and I would like to say salam alaikum to you and your audience. Um, uh, as you mentioned that um, the communication pl between police and community is really not any different than anywhere else, whether it's Toronto, Ottawa or anywhere else in Canada or North America. Basically, what we're seeing more and more for basically um, those of us I've been here in, in Canada for the last 30 years, what we're seeing is that um, making the black man as a villain um, and especially for uh, black Muslim men is, is uh, basically being targeted as if they are a threat to the society and they are always looking at their shoulders and um, that has been an issue that a lot of community members try to voice, try to educate, try to uh, build the bridges and work with the, whether it's Ottawa police or a Toronto police, police force. But unfortunately, we've been seeing that um, uh, it's an issue that it's not fully rectified. And basically our young man is paying for, our sons are paying for it. Uh, there's so many um, murder and killed and arrested um, black young men, especially Somali community and Muslim community, and their cases have not been resolved. So I would say it's a very difficult relationship. Of course, that those of our who are from black community or um, activists or leaders or Muslims who are trying to, um, you know, build the bridge and uh, always sit on the table for dialogue but it's a very tough um, relationship to maintain and it's very um, difficult to uh, uh, you know see every headline that another young man which is either black or black muslim has been killed or been uh, you know um, on the receiving end of police brutality Right, and, and that, uh, I understand that uh, relationship got even more difficult uh, with the news of uh, the verdict of uh, uh, Constable Daniel Mon. So we'll get to that. But uh, to, just to go back to the 24th of July, uh, 2016, uh, you uh, partially witnessed uh, that incident where the interaction between the Ottawa police officers and the late Abdurrahman Abdi. What do you remember about that and what can you tell us about that? You know, it's one of those realities that um, you always read in the news that, uh, uh, you know, a young man has been arrested and, you know, um, you know, um, it, it targeted by the Ottawa police or otherwise. But I never thought that I, I would see it, you know, with a person that I know and very close. So for me that it was really shocking and terrifying. I just heard a huge bang, like somebody crying for his life. 
uh, on, it was a beautiful Sunday morning. The windows were open just for fresh air. We live in the fourth floor in the building at the time. And just hearing the man cried out loud for the last, perhaps the, the breath or sound of his uh, life, I just jumped out of bed and went to the big window and um, noticed him being on the ground. And at the time they were trying to handcuff him. And the first instant was like shock. And, you know, I, I just couldn't believe, uh, you know, I'm a civil war survivor. I came to this country as a teenager. I have two sons myself. It's one of those things that you don't expect to anyone that you know, and you don't expect one of your sons or one of your brothers or, or one of your neighbors. So for me, it was absolutely horrifying and shocked to see that Abdurrahman that I knew that I used to see his smile in the elevator and would say Salam is the one who is lying down dead bleeding on the hands of Ottawa police. So that was really shock. But at the same time that, you know, we think bad things will not happen. And some of us, we dismiss when we see the murders or the police brutality of young men. So for me, I actually witnessing it, realized that this is not something that we can close our eyes uh, and right away was the action of just, uh, it started with recording the last 87 minutes of, of his, 27 minutes of his life. Oh man, um, that video is gruesome for those of, uh, of you who didn't see it. It's online and we will put it in the description and you can uh, uh, see it for yourself. Um, after a lengthy uh, internal discussion uh, with the uh, Ottawa police uh, force, um, the co constable Daniel uh, Massion, uh, was charged with manslaughter and aggravated assault. Um, and after a, a lengthy trial, uh, he was found not guilty in his interactions, contributing to the death of uh, late Abdurrahman Abdi. How did the um, trial unfold? What, was, what were the frustrations? I understand there's a, there's a lot of um, demonstrations continuing right now in Ottawa. Uh, at, at that verdict, uh, at that result. Um, what can you tell me about the trial? How, what was the perception there? I understand video evidence of that recording was uh, presented to the judge. Um, tell us a bit about how that unfolded. It has been um, very difficult for years. And I think that we had both um, a bittersweet, I would say. It, it was horrifying to see that um, what we witnessed and the officer who took the life of Abdurrahman was cleared from all charges and he could just walk, walk away and walk on the streets. And uh, I think one of his lawyers said that he would be going back to work. That is devastating. And, you know, uh, we did not expect that. And that would be uh, you know, something that we still will not expect, we will not accept it. Justice will continue, and we'll be continuing to fighting for justice. However, those four years has been, uh, I would say, uh, a learning journey, a learning experience for our community um, that uh, a, we had allies that joined together from, um, you know, uh, the Huntenburg community around Hilda where Abdurrahman Abdi died from the masjid on that area, from the church at Parkdale United Church, from the community center on that area, from the neighbors to black and white and brown and everyone. So just to have, we used to wear shirts that say standing together. And that did not, this really didn't matter that Abdurrahman was a black man or Abdurrahman was a Muslim. What mattered was that this happened in our community on a Sunday morning where everybody was either having a breakfast, walking with their dogs, enjoying, you know, a Sunday morning with their children. And for our children and elderly and parents to witness a murder in the capital city of the country is unacceptable. And also that for Abdurrahman's mother to lose a son, that he, she brought him to Canada running away from war. And he was a young man who, were, who was mentally ill, but at the same time, very sweet, you know, amazing personality, always have a smile on his face. So for him to, uh, you know, to be killed on that morning was something that 
in the entire community said, uh-uh, this is not happening in our watch. So for those four years, really what kept us going and gave us uh, a hope uh, and you know there could be a light at the end of the tunnel was the community pulling together but also an education and also that fighting for policies that you know discri discriminate our youth whether it's public education whether it's um you know police and carding whether it's policies siu invest investigations and how you know there's no transparency when they're investigating with police officers when it comes on oversight so everywhere from um, you know uh, uh, sitting with the mayor's office, uh, writing to the premier's office, um, writing to attorney uh, uh, attorney general, it was a fight that really not only it, it brought community together, but it also educated us. And it also showed us that how we can channel our anger, not only to just sit there and cry and go on the streets and protest for a few days and get tired, but also change the system who's discriminating our men and our boys. So for that, I would say that four years has been, uh, you know, a journey, it has been healing, it has been uh, uniting community, but the verdict was slap on the face. Right. And this is a fight that's far from being over. Right. And I, and I understand yeah. that. Uh, if I can go back to one of the things that you mentioned and uh, is relevant to the case is the mental health aspect mm -hmm. of what happened that day. Um, yeah. How was the police, how did the uh, involvement uh, between uh, Abdurrahman and, and the police start? Um, uh, a lot has been said about the incidents that preceded the interaction with the police. What can you tell us about that day and what happened? I mean, um, as a parent, uh, you know, uh, I tell my sons that how to interact with the police. Uh, if my older son takes my car, you know, coming home early, uh, if you've been sp stopped with a police officer, how to handle what to say, how to stay safe. Uh, but that, that kind of conversation um, but works. Prior with, to the, but prior to the interaction. But uh, this is what I meant. Generally, as yeah. parents, this is what we do. But right. unfortunately, that kind of conversation is difficult if your son has a mental illness. Right. So Abdurrahman was unfortunately a young man who was mentally ill. So the conversation usually, uh, you know, mothers and, and fathers have their black uh, you know, uh, sons to tell them how to handle police officers. And if you have an interaction with the police officers, how to just put up your hand and stay quiet and, you know, be safe. Um, that kind of conversations does not work with our young black men who are mentally ill. So unfortunately, Abdurrahman went to this coffee shop, Second Cup, we know that there is an incident that happened in this uh, uh, coffee shop. Regardless of what that incident was, Abdurrahman didn't deserve to die. He did not deserve to be killed. We know that any one of us, if we have a traffic violation, if we run a red light, if we commit a crime, okay, you can arrest the person and bring them to justice. They can hire a lawyer and they can argue with their case. Nobody has the right to be killed for a minor incident, or even if it's a major incident that happens in the coffee shop. So apparently something happened in the coffee shop and police officers were called. Um, Abdurrahman being a young man who's mentally ill and also a civil war survivor, he got scared and terrified. So he tried to run back home where his mother was. And the moment they caught on him and they start beating, it was right on the front of the doorsteps of the home. So now this young man that we're talking about is he never had any criminal record before and he's not armed and he's running away, right? So there has to be a way and this is one of the things we're demanding for not only the Ottawa police but all the uh, police institutions or all the cities there has to be a way for police officers to de-escalate situations right. and to learn how to arrest uh, for individuals with mental illness. And we know what happened in Toronto, among other, the, all the cases that was before Abdurrahman and after Abdurrahman. So when we sat with one of the uh, uh, previous Ottawa chief, uh, police chief, we found out only two 
every 10 police officers have the training of how to deal with mental illness, individuals or de-escalate situations. So one of our asks and demands are more training for police officers to learn how to not only de-escalate situations, but also deal with individuals with mental health, uh, mental illness. Right. There's uh, much is said about the underlining health conditions that uh, Abdurrahman had alongside with the mental illness and how it may or may not have contributed uh, to his death. What can you tell us about that? What did the autopsy uh, show? Uh, what was the overall, uh, you know, results of, of, of that investigation? Well, I Still mean, yeah, yeah. Abdurrahman's mental uh, illness and his conditions and his medical records are private to his family it's not something we can talk about right. but um, one thing we can say for sure is that he was fine and he was taking his medication and walking around and interacting with my own children and the children in the building and as neighbors we didn't we never saw him as a threat uh, he was always polite smiling quiet kept to himself and what happened to that morning was unacceptable and he didn't have to die. I mean, uh, justice, um, it's, it's, just, it's just appalling. Well, every yeah. time I think back, I, I just lose words because the image of him um, laying down on those doorsteps bleeding and his mother crying and her son never coming back is just so horrific. And it's something that I, I wish no parent ever experiences that. Having said that, the parents uh, around the country and perhaps in the world continue um, uh, to feel that threat uh, within their family spheres. What can you tell? It's, it, these incidents, though they're getting closer and closer to home uh, individually, uh, there's a broader view of, of communities and families thinking, oh, that happened in Ottawa or that happened in Minneapolis or that is currently happening in Nigeria. So what is needed as a prevention uh, within the communities uh, to have this conversation prior to incidents like this happening? Is there a value in starting that conversation? I think that, um, I don't know if I, am, if I can say it right, and I will not translate. They're saying in Somali that, um, something like that. Right. That what happened to Abdurrahman could happen to anyone. It could happen to my brothers. It could happen to anyone's husband. It could happen to anyone's son. Um, so this is affecting all of us. Right. Um, I think I was one of those parents that stayed quiet prior to Abdurrahman's case. Right. And I think, in, especially to be specific in the Somali community, when a Somali young man is being arrested or uh, apprehended or, or, or um, is a victim of police brutality, there's this notion of, or, you know, he was at the wrong time at the wrong place. Was he in the nightclub? Was he drinking? Was he using drugs? Uh, was he, uh, did he have a criminal record? But what I have learned and came to terms as a mother is that th those are actually irrelevant. We have communities that, um, you know, uh, in any community when their sons, you know, uh, go to addiction, they take them to rehabilitation and they, they make man out of them and they give them second chances. Why our boys don't deserve that? So I think the Muslim community and Somali community need to wake up and accept their sons for who they are, regardless of any kind of life choices that they make. They're human beings, their life needs to be protected. And if they are you know, in trouble or if they're drinking or if they are, you know, uh, using drugs, there is methods of rehabilitating, but they're, they should not be treated as a lost cause. And none of them deserves to be uh, killed on the hands of people who are supposed to protect them. So I think we need to come together and put those stereotypical. Like a lot of what I notice is that even the Somali parents who lose a son, out of shame, they will hide. So, you know, the Somalis say that we should speak out, we should seek for justice. It's okay if a child makes mistakes. We are the one who brought them in North America where everybody's drinking and using drugs. They're dealing with a lot of issues that forces them to use substance, sometimes to numb their pain. 
So we need to figure it out and have the conversation and find ways to help our boys and also protect them. But we should not treat them as a lost cost because this right. is very close home, very cl right. close to home. Right. So what are the uh, next steps for the, uh, for the advocacy group and how could people get involved uh, uh, you know, uh, with those efforts? There is a lot is happening. And I think that uh, one of the things that we succeeded to do for the last four years is to launch a website, Justice for Abdurrahman website. Um, I think there's also Facebook and other social medias, but the website literally outlines all the different legislations that we are trying to fight, whether it's municipality or provincial that you can take part of or uh, petitions you can take part of, but there's also in the website that ways that regardless of where you're at, you get involved in whether you volunteer or you, whether you become a part of the advocacy. But another thing that we are really looking forward is that we have been building an advocacy for the uh, last four years and literally put together a blueprint of how to tackle these kind of issues. And we are more than happy to share in any city uh, who are also wanted to initiate, uh, you know, and wanted to formalize this. The group who is leading Justice for Abdurrahman is a group of young, uh, majority of them are Somali Muslims, but lawyers, professionals, so civil servants, nurses, educators, who got together every day after work on weekends to do this. So we can all do this. Right. And, and inshallah that uh, we can see a justice being served. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lima Ali, uh, for joining us today to discuss this broad issue. And uh, we appreciate your time and, and, and in this and, uh, and other endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jazakallah khair. Thank you for having me today. You're very welcome. Take good care. Well,